morning. Hey, good morning. I can hear you now. How are you doing? Well, I'm very well, thanks. Ah, oh, good. Hey, thank you for coming on. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad that you reached out to me. It's, uh, it's unusual that I get an opportunity to talk about a movie star. I've seen you guys live I think the last four times you've come to Europe. Uh, Is that right? Yeah. And uh, so I was watching your uh, live uh, Hootenanny that you do on YouTube, and I just saw some pictures in the background. I was like, I wonder if he's a, a fan. Well, who isn't? I mean, I feel like you could talk to just about anybody on earth. I, I, I don't know, generationally, maybe it's different now. You know, kids, kids today might grow up without a sense of who Charlie Chaplin was, but definitely for me, I mean, I, you know, I grew up on reruns. I, I grew up watching Our Gang and, um, um, uh, you know, like Laurel and Hardy. I read somewhere that, didn't you, uh, you recorded in, one, in the old Charlie Chaplin studios, no? Oh, yeah. Uh, we sure did. Um, and, um, you know, uh, um, seeing... I can't remember what this documentary was, but it was about, maybe it, maybe it ran at a, a we, we called it the Henson lot. That's what you call. Yeah, the, the Jim Henson company. Uh, company, yeah. And then the old timers there call it the A&M lot um, from the <laughs> Herb Albert time. Exactly. Uh, and there's nobody left there who's going to call it the Chaplin lot, but it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, he built it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean... That's one place I've never been to, which I definitely need to go and visit at some point. But I heard that they preserved a lot of the, the work he did. Man, it's beautiful. you got to go. you got to go take the pilgrimage um, because, like, he, he certainly, I mean, it's, it's like a little piece of England in Hollywood. It's Tudor. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's, like, gables and archways. And, oh, really? Um, you pull in as if you're in a motor car and not in... You know, uh, I mean, the last time I was there, I think it was like at the height of American Idol and um, and Randy Jackson had pulled in with like a like a stretch SUV. <laughs> OK. And, and it, the vehicle just barely got in to, to your grandfather's archway. <laughs> <laughs> but a real sign of the times, like what is entertainment now? What is what does a Hollywood studio do? Mm. Um, you know, the. You, you know the 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 place that your dad broke that your grandfather broke ground and made this fertile um, um, studio locale for artists to do their thing has been such a fruitful place. Um, I, I think the fact that um, you know I didn't learn about Charlie and his his um, you know, building of the of the studio until we'd been there a couple of weeks, and ahead of that, the most amazing thing to me was that it's where We Are the World was recorded. Michael Jackson actually came. He was a huge Chaplin fan, and he came to visit us in because uh, I'm originally from Switzerland, and I grew up in my grandfather's house when he moved to Switzerland. Is uh, Una your grandmother? Una is my grandmother. Yes, beautiful lady. Yes, yes, and I guess that's I can see that in in your eyes. <laughs> we have very strong genes in the family. So uh, basically, you you went from busking on the streets to winning a Grammy Award for Best Folk Album, right? For the album Remedy. Yeah, I mean, there's about 15, 18 years in between those bookends, but it's true. Did you ever think that would happen? Yeah, I did. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I don't know about the, the accolade, like, you know, we got a couple of Grammys. We, I didn't know that Wagon Wheel was going to sell, I don't know, but combined with Darius, like 11 million copies or something crazy. You know, I didn't know it was going to be like that. Um, but I knew that it was a good song and mm. that it was going to be memorable for people and that they were going to want to hear it. But again, because my orientation to the music business and to the performance arts began at the curb, everything was up, you know? What do you mean? Every, anything was possible when you started at the very beginning, you know? Like I felt it's like Geppetto and, and little Pinocchio, you know? Um, all he wants to do is lose his strings. And then the adventure just continues, and the most fantastic things can happen when you lose your strings. How long, how long were you busking for? Oh, I, I started busking when I was a, um, 
maybe 15 was the first wow. time I went out and really did it, made money. Um, and then, you know, I kept doing it until I was 25. Wow. Okay. That's I mean, that's like you said, the experience must have been the stuff that you can't learn anywhere else. I imagine. It was really rich, you know, like cops shutting you down and <laughs> um, homeless people either supporting you or threatening you, yeah. you know, the, the kind of urchins of the street. Uh, and then all of the attitudes of everyone from the tourists to the locals. Oh, the, the best was the other buskers and how defensive they are. Yeah, how many times have you played the Ryman Auditorium? Well, like 40 times? Oh, yeah, I mean, probably 60 or 80. Oh, really? So, so I found out that my grandfather was there as well during the First World, World War, selling war bonds. Every, every time we're there, um, you know, it's one of those things that you can say from the stage and just you get a whoop every time. And, and I say it, I say it every time. And I put him in good company. I say, Charlie Chaplin stood here. And so did Dr. Martin Luther King. Yeah. Amazing. How would you describe Charlie Chaplin to a, a younger audience? Um, I, I think um, how I'd like to answer that is how, how would I help assist them? Because anybody who's exposed to Charlie Chaplin is going to like him. But today's kid has fewer of the skills because film is arresting. Film stops you in your tracks. Mm. It's just what it does. I mean, I'm looking at you on the screen right now. I'm not looking at all the other shit around me, which I could be looking at, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I'm looking at the screen because there's a moving picture there. I'm still fascinated by that. And it's been 108 years since, you know, the trail. Yeah. <laughs> and I still want to see what's on. I still want to see the motion picture. Um, so. I think kids are going to love Chaplin and all silent film. Um, but the, the, I think it's about how do you teach a kid to have that nuanced understanding of um, you know, how to enjoy a picture show that doesn't have, you know, the furious five exploding across the screen and like a exactly. constant orgasm of color and light and, and editing point. And, you know, I mean, God, it's like how to teach a kid to like buttered toast. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I've had some of the best meals of my life have been toast. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like a good slice, I'm talking about, <laughs> with like the, when it gets all cringly. And but, it's a, but it, you know, it's a very good point because the best food that you could ever try is usually the, the simplest food, like you're saying. Yeah, like a good poached egg on a exactly. slice of toast. So I, I, I would tell kids, watch his eyes watch his legs, watch his arms, watch the way his body is telling a story. Think about puppets and, uh, and think about marionettes and mm -hmm. what is it like to gesticulate? I mean, how, does, how, do, how do your gesticulations speak to what's inside your heart? I feel like we're, we're you, know, you know, you see that wonderful scene where the, where the cabin is teetering on the edge in the Klondike. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that's us on the playground with our friends, you know, on a merry-go-round, seeing eye to eye. I think it's really easy for kids to, to identify with it. Um, it just, they just need to be exposed to it. Yeah. And, and, it, and it can slow you down. Uh, and it's so, it's so ironic that it's shot at such high speeds uh, when, in <laughs> fact, it takes such a slowdown. I don't know how much work have you, you've seen of uh, my grandfather's, but do you have a favorite scene or movie or anything? Or um, It's been so long since I saw anything other than The Gold Rush. Yeah. So can I answer that with The Gold Rush? Yes, of course. Of course. Okay. I mean, it's, a, it's like one of his classics. So, you, you know, you can't really go wrong. I mean, he's got the classic scene of him eating the shoe. You know, uh, it's a, a great film, great movie. When he's eating that shoe, mm -hmm. he's eating it like somebody who's eaten from a trash can before. Exactly. Yeah. No. And, and so it's so believable. And, <laughs> and yet the self and, and I think that the, that's the self-deprecatory is the ultimate comedic medium. Yeah. I think his relishing of the lace <laughs> yeah. and the delicacy with which he pats his lips. Yeah. The, the twisting into the corner of the napkin. <laughs> exactly.
yeah, my grandmother, I mean, was uh, amazing. And uh, my dad was the first child born in Switzerland uh, in 1953. So uh, oh, this is after the blacklisting. Yeah. So he, he, what happened was is that he was on a he was on a a, a ship on his way over to England f- to uh, do some promotion for Limelight when he received the telegram that he's not going to be allowed back into the U.S. You know, I, I, I think that the main reason that Charlie Chaplin was blacklisted was because he was feared, because he was perceived as a threat. A hundred percent. I mean, he, he definitely thought that the, the Russians were at the front of the war, but it, he, that's what he said. He says, without the Russians, basically, we would all be screwed. Uh, and they kind of took that as, you know, he's a communist sympathizer. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really intense conversation to, to think about. I mean, so here we are in the United States um, this weekend on my on my TV show, which is like the closest I get to being Charlie Chaplin. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's uh, it's Memorial Day this weekend, so I'm thinking a lot about um, about the the troops and about America's military history and um, the and and largely I'm thinking about Europe in the 20th century which is just one of the most intense experiences that I think humanity has ever undergone. Mm. Um, possibly a definition of hell on earth. Um, and, and somehow we're all still here. Somehow stability was able to come out of, out of that. And it's not stability for everyone, for all peoples, but certainly the, you know, the rise of fascism in the 20th century is the thing that happened. I mean, this century that we're on the, that we look back on, Charlie Chaplin's century, Bob Dylan's century, mm-hmm. um, this is like the, the dyingest century of all. And, and so here in this global pandemic in which we're thinking a lot about mortality and we're thinking a lot about, about, um, about global catastrophe. Yeah. Um, we happen to be, I mean, it's kind of a, a postscript at this point. It's really an epilogue to the global catastrophe. It has come. So he won an honor, honorary Oscar towards the end of his life, the Lifetime Achievement Award. And they asked him to, to, to go get it, obviously, in, I guess it was in L.A. Or, and uh, even then, after all those years, you know, he'd been out of the country for over 20 years, he got a. He, they only gave him a one-week visa. Yeah, I've seen some footage of that. Um, it's really powerful. Yeah, longest standing ovation ever at the Oscars. <laughs> you know, when I, so when I see that, I, I think about another thing, and that's about who else is in the wings. Uh, you know, um, like because because my favorite silent film star is Burt Williams. Okay. Are you familiar with? And Bill, Burt was also a great musician and a yeah. songwriter. Um, and he's the guy who um, W.C. Fields said, I've never seen a funnier man or a sadder one. Oh, really? Um, and so when you think about Chaplin accepting the award the, of, of, of a lifetime's achievement in film, um, you know, even though your grandfather is, is undoubtedly the most important of them, mm. um, there are so many who contributed that didn't get a Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, that whether they were blacklisted or not, they just didn't get renewed. And the, mm-hmm. the fickle nature of Hollywood, the high turnover rates, I mean, this is the same thing in the music business. It's like the, 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 the equal would be that, that um, Mississippi John Hurt gets to play the 1963 Newport Folk Festival. And, you know, and a hundred white girls throw his, their panties at, at this 80 year old man. Yeah. But, um, but all of his compatriots from 1927, when he first stepped into a studio, they all died broke. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And that's more or less what happened to people like Buster Keaton, you know, uh, yeah. all these, all these other signings. He was so like, even Laurel and Hardy towards the end of their life, you know, they're, to- they're touring their asses off just uh, to, to make some money. And uh, all because, like you say, Hollywood and all the studios at the time, that was their thing, was just pay, they're, they're paying them no- nothing. Um, and that's what my grandfather fought for, was, uh, you know, 
to, 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 for everyone to get paid. Started United Artists as well, you know. So it, he was definitely an advocate for that. But he's one of the lucky ones that kind of strived for it and pushed for it and, and got what he wanted in the end. Yeah, but, you know, just the fact that he's there, and I, and I think it's just important to, to re, you know, review that piece of film and know that he's not the only one on the podium. That when Hollywood takes a moment to reflect mm. upon itself, which, you know, it does all damn day. It's such a meta environment. Yeah. But it's, its self-reflection is so shallow. 100%. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it, it thinks the mirror is like an inch deep. These are the performance arts. Yeah. I mean, what, you know, the Fast and the Furious, it don't, that don't mean shit. No. Sorry. No, 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 no. Because <laughs> 85 years from now, none of the stuff that sold a billion dollars in a weekend, none of that's going to get a Lifetime Achievement Award. That's what we're going to forget. <laughs> well, Catch, thank you so much for coming on, huh? Yeah, well, good luck with the podcast, and thanks everybody who was tuned in. I really enjoyed getting to speak with um, with uh, Charlie Chaplin's grandson today, Spencer Chaplin, and uh, thank you, and thank you for uh, for accommodating me. And it's always good to have these transatlantic connections. So exactly, let's keep doing it. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Catch. All right. All right. God take bless. it easy. You too. Bye bye.